So I'd like to start this session with a brief summary. The last session we had was a little bit more difficult than most sessions because we talked about the four different kinds of samadhis. Obviously, this is quite a challenging topic. So, a brief summary. The next sutra that we are doing is, in fact, you can say more or less a summary. We stopped at sutra 1.45 the last time, chapter 1, verse 45, and verse 46 is basically a summary of the previous verses. It says, these are the four forms of absorption with objects. Objects as in bija, that is an object, bija. This means that whenever we are concentrating on something, we are absorbed in something, we need an object. Some of the classical objects for concentration in yoga are breath, a certain space in the body, whether it may be the abdominal area, it could be the space um, of the heart, it could be the space between the eyebrows. So there are certain focal points in the body or there are subtler objects of concentration like mantras. Now, all these are considered to be objects. We talked about Sarvitharg and Sarvichar Samadhi in which Sarvitharg is a little bit more gross form, is generally, generally a physical object. So you have something like rituals, etc. These are more gross forms. And then there are subtler forms. We talked about the subtler forms could be, for example, one of the senses. When you're studying speech, for example, this is also a form of meditation and it's a subtle object. So the process is moving from gross to subtle. And as we go to, towards the subtler most, it takes us right to the non-manifest, that is pure consciousness. We have seen that again, I'll show it to you in this, where you could have a object here somewhere, in the external world, if it's a ritual, or on the body itself, such as the diaphragm, the space between the nostrils, part of the body, anywhere on the body, would be also object of concentration. The breath itself, or when you're studying the mind, the different aspects of the mind, and as you proceed in words with the mantra, it goes subtler and subtler. You see the movement is from the gross to the subtle inward. And it gets subtler still here until finally it leads us to the subtle most, which is the center of consciousness right here. This is the center of consciousness. So... This is how these forms of samadhi can lead us inward. So anything which is external to pure consciousness, this is pure consciousness, and anything that is external to it is an object. So the object 
can lie anywhere in this area. It is all called bija. So any object, even if the object happens to be the mind itself or an aspect of the mind, it is still called sabija samadhi because it has an object. So when we sometimes talk about external objects in the Yoga Sutra, it does not always mean a physical object here, but it can also mean a mantra that's also external. You can see how important this aspect of concentration is. From childhood, we see this idea, we want to be absorbed in certain things. So when they're little children, they're playing with blocks or very small children, they like to examine everything. They put everything in their mouth, they want to examine it, they will take some utensils and some spoon and they start banging. Why? They want to study sound. This is a way they study the world. They're studying all these objects around them. And this is an important aspect because when we disturb the children, they do not have this nice feeling after that, which we call nirvita or nirvichar. When somehow words seem to disappear and you are in a feeling of bliss or happiness. So it's very important that we let children develop this right from a very young age to not disturb them when they're concentrated on something. Playing for example is very important for children because they are very focused and very concentrated when they play. And rather than continuously disturbing them and telling them what to do, we just let them be when they're very deeply absorbed in something. So that was just a brief, more or less a, a summary of the earlier verses about Samadhi, about Savitar and Nirvitak Samadhi and Savitar and Nirvichar Samadhi, going from gross to subtle. So we continue now. It gets easier, not more difficult, but easier. And if there are any questions, please let me know. You can, at the end of every verse, I will ask if you have any questions and we can take the time to answer these questions. So what happens when one has acquired Nirvitar Samadhi or Nirvichar Samadhi? Nirvichar or Nirvitak is meant you're so absorbed, especially Nirvichar, when you're absorbed in the subtler, subtler object of concentration, that there are no words. It's just a feeling of joy. When you have attained this, then you experience a certain sharpness of cognition and this sharpness of cognition is developed with samadhi. What is the faculty of cognition? It is called buddhi. That aspect in you which sees through everything, knows what is right and wrong. That aspect is called buddhi. And 
This means that samadhi sharpens your sense of cognition. You begin to see things really clearly as they are. It is uncolored with all our usual ideas which we superimpose on these objects. So for example, you see a dog. Normally, when anybody sees a dog, a dog is colored. It's not just a dog. You will see a dog and depending on the experiences you've had with the dog, you're going to be either scared of the dog or you're going to like the dog. You feel attracted and you want to pet the dog and you want to talk to the dog. But if you've had a negative experience, you've been bitten or you've been attacked by a dog, then you are afraid and you have a different coloring. So a dog is not just a dog. But having had an experience of high level of concentration on an object, if you have attained that level of absorption on an object that we would call samadhi, whether it is servitark or servichar, it does not matter. What does happen is that buddhi is sharpened, becomes very sharp, it becomes very clear and is able to see objects for what they are. That object is no longer as colored as it was before. So, well, other people might experience objects as very colored, you will start seeing the world differently from them. So, one of the results of samadhi is a very sharp bhutti. Any questions on this? To everybody uh, who is new, I would just like to make a request that if you write me a private question, it is very difficult for me to respond to you. It's like teacher is in the class and then student comes and asks questions in between. So the questions should be addressed to the general chat and then I will see that in the general chat or you, of course, you can speak. So I think somebody tried to say something. Was it Sachin? Somebody wanted to ask a question, I think, or wanted to make a comment. Okay. So, Manash, Manash says, why is an object called a bija? Yes, these are seeds. Bija is seed, and any object is called a seed. Why is it called a seed? Okay, um, let's go to our diagram. So, for example, you are identified with the mind. And so, at the level of the mind, when you look out, this is what you see, this is your vision here. And you will see maybe the breath. You are able to see maybe parts of the body or an external object. Now, if your object is a ritual object, maybe a deity, for example, even that is considered to be a seed. Why? What is the quality of a seed? Quality of a seed is that it grows. And so it's called a seed because that is a form of knowledge, something grows out of it. So mantras, for example, are also called seeds. So a lot of these objects are considered to be seeds because there is a potential in it. That's the quality of a seed, something can grow out of it. It's a hidden potential. So therefore, any object is called a seed because it has a hidden potential in it. 
So the question is, um, can Samadhi help you get out of Maya? I think that's the question from Sachin. Yes, that is the purpose of meditation. If you attain Samadhi, it depends on the level of Samadhi. There are many different levels. So the grosser forms or the subtler forms of Samadhi can be maintained maybe for a short while by most people. But you need to be established in it for a longer period of time and only then can you be really uh, remain established here in the center of consciousness. Then you are truly free from Maya. Otherwise, if you only have a few experiences like that of Nirvichar Samadhi, your buddhi will get sharpened for sure. Your cognition will be clearer. You will be able to see the world as it is. But you will not be totally free or liberated. But you are pretty much on the right track. Shibu says, are vasanas also called bijas? Well, vasana is the same thing as samskaras. And samskaras, technically vasanas and samskaras are not called bijas. But they are like seeds in the sense that out of vasanas and samskaras, we grow. We grow out of this. This is where vasanas are here in the latent unconscious mind. These are where the samskaras are also. There's no difference between vasana and samskara other than that vasana is very ancient. Samskaras are not that ancient. They will, they will grow immediately while vasanas are more the bed, you know, the foundation. So, technically speaking, they are not called bijas, but they function like that because this grows out of it. The active mind, the conscious mind, the breath, the body, the senses, all grows out of the, these samskaras, okay? Okay, um, we would, it's best we continue. The subject of samadhi is naturally a little bit esoteric and it can become a little intellectual. So uh, I don't want to go too deep into it. So we take this last question. The question is, if someone enters samadhi through one of the objects like breath, will he be able to see all objects as colorless? I'm not sure if you mean colorless as a klishta or colorless as is without coloring, you mean. Uh, it doesn't matter what the object is. It is... If you enter samadhi, you don't see all objects as colorless or with less coloring. Generally, the coloring attenuates, but it doesn't mean that you see all objects as a klishta. You will have still klishta. You will have kleshas, and we need to work on the kleshas. Initially, few kleshas and then the whole process accelerates okay it's an accelerating process so what happens next when we have had some experience of samadhi the buddhi is purified and then we experience a state known as ritambara such a state is known as ritambara filled with truth so when you have experienced nirvichar samadhi words seem to disappear when the words disappear it's not like there's an emptiness sometimes people think 
Meditation is a blank state of mind. There's nothing. In reality, what it is is that there is something filling that space, and that is truth. It's not empty, it's full. And this is the experience you have when you are able to perceive directly, as direct cognition. So now you don't have this intellectual thinking, analysis, that's not required. Your perception is not mixed with all these colored objects. You know, these objects where you feel, oh, this is aversion, there's attachment. All these objects make it more difficult for us to see things clearly. But when we have experienced this, at least for some time, you are able to see things clearly and you are filled with truth. It's a, it's a bhava, it's a feeling and experience of being filled with truth. And it's important to remember here that this is not necessarily a permanent state because a meditator may not be really completely established in this state. The samskaras are still there. There are still many kleshas and all these have to be purified. And these kleshas or these samskaras will drag you back down into this worldly, phenomenal world. So what is this truth or what is this knowledge that you get from Nirvichars, Samadhi? It's, this knowledge is very different from that which is obtained through inference or from testimony because it's the direct experience of the knowledge itself, of the object itself. We have gone through this in verse 1.7 where we discussed that there are three ways of getting knowledge, correct knowledge, right knowledge. One is testimony or shruti, that's when the scriptures tell us something or the teacher says, then that is shruti or the testimony. Second is inference, you infer something. And third is direct cognition. So, inference, which is called Anuman, we can infer through contemplation. For example, the scriptures tell us that the world is not permanent and there's only one thing that's eternal, and that is pure consciousness. We can infer this through contemplation. You contemplate like this. When I was a child, I looked different. I was a baby. I looked totally different. And when I was a child, I grew up and I had different interests. I was more interested in some toys. Then when I became a little older, a teenager, I looked totally different. And now I was not interested in toys anymore. I was interested in other things. Then I became an adult. I looked again different. And now I was not even interested in those things that I was interested in when I was a teenager. Now I'm occupied with thoughts of career, responsibilities, job, etc. Yet, even though my physical body has changed and my interests have changed, my mind has changed, my personality may even have changed, Still, something is the same. That one identity which makes me Radhika is still the same. So, there must be something which is constant and permanent. So, in this manner, I can contemplate and validate the 
scriptures and the teachings of, of our teachers and gurus. But still, all the same, this is not direct cognition. You may still not have had a direct experience of your consciousness. So you see, this process of moving from testimony to inference to direct cognition is an expansion of consciousness. I will use an example to, to explain you how the mind expands in consciousness. When a child is a small child, likes to eat a lot of sweets. Then the mother will say, you are eating too many sweets. I'm going to put away these sweets right up here where you cannot reach them. So the mother will put away the sweets maybe on the shelf where the child cannot reach it. But when the mother is not looking, what does the child do? The child gets a chair and climbs up to get the sweets from the shelf. Now the child thinks that the mother cannot see because when the child looks around, he doesn't see the mother. But he doesn't know that through the, ref through the shadow which is falling or a reflection somewhere, the mother has inferred that the child is now trying to steal some sweets. And then the mother says, I can, I know you are trying to steal the sweets. Don't do that. The child gets a shock. How did mother know? You see, from the point of view of the child, this seems like some sort of a miracle. But actually, what happened was that the mother simply has a larger, a wider field of awareness. It's a different level of consciousness. The field of awareness is simply greater. While the field of awareness of a child is not as developed. A few years later, the child figures out how the mother knew it. Because his awareness also expands. So this is how awareness expands. And knowledge from direct experience is very different from that knowledge obtained through testimony or inference. Just reading a book, whether it is the scriptures or any other book, is different because that's a testimony. Contemplating and inferring is a slightly higher level of understanding because it's an internal process but the highest level is that of direct cognition so any questions about this So what happens in meditation is we want to expand our awareness. We want to expand our consciousness. So if you go back to our diagram and we see over there that most people are identified with objects here in the external world. So if you are identified with your job, with your car or the house you live in, and you think if you have a great car, you feel great. So then you are only your awareness is only about the external world. This is your awareness. You're not aware of your own body. You're not aware of your own mind, your moods, nothing. Now, if you're identified with your body, that's why you always want to look good, you dress up a lot, you're very you want to be healthy, you're aware of your physical health, 
when you are identified to the body and you think you're the body, then this is your awareness. This is your field of awareness. Right? And so you may start to live a healthy lifestyle, which is good. It's an expansion. You're not only focused on the objects outside, but you have expanded your awareness to include now your body. When you expand your awareness further, the breath and the mind, then you start becoming aware of... You see the expansion that has taken place? This is much bigger field of awareness. Yeah. And so your awareness has expanded. Now you become more self-aware, maybe of your moods, how you're talking, what you're saying to people, and you become more aware of your body, the relationship between the breath and the mind, the relationship between the thoughts and the physical health, and your relationship with the world itself. So your awareness has expanded. As you learn to go in the world, your awareness expands even further. Now we get into the area of Siddhis, you know, powers. When, when you get access to the unconscious mind, then we experience all kinds of things which other people find amazing. But in fact, it's just like the little child who was amazed that his mother knew he was getting the sweets. How did the mother know? She simply had a broader field of consciousness. She had expanded. And so, when you learn meditation and you are able to expand your conscious mind into the unconscious here a bit, you become aware of the things in the unconscious mind, then they, don't, they are no longer unconscious. And you have again expanded your awareness to this much. So much more. If you are able to expand your awareness to the latent state, this is really very advanced, then your adept, your siddha, then this is your level of awareness. Which means now you're really very close to being established in pure consciousness itself. When you're finally established here, that means everything becomes external. And the mind itself, the whole mind itself, becomes an object of concentration. So the journey of meditation is basically the journey of expanding consciousness. Any questions here? Then we go to the to the next sutra, and that is number fifty. Sutra fifty says, "The knowledge that you get out of samadhi, what we call rithambara, this correct cognition, it forms impressions in the mind." So just as you, you create impressions when you go in the world and if somebody tells you you're stupid, then you created an impression and you accepted the suggestion, then there's an impression created in the mind which says you are stupid. And that maybe gets reinforced because now you really believe you're stupid and then you start acting stupid. 
or somebody tells you are very good at something, then that impression is transient. So just as you acquire impressions from the world, similarly, you acquire impressions when you experience samadhi. But the impressions are very different. We're going to fast forward to chapter 4. In chapter 4, samskaras are explained. And it says that there are basically four kinds. Those that are black. These are samskaras coming out of misdeeds. When you do wrong things, you get black karma and black samskaras. When you do virtuous deeds, you get good samskaras. But most of our action is mixed. It's black and white. Now meditation or samadhi, the impressions from this are very unique. They are neither black nor are they white. Because these samskaras are from a non-dual state. Everything else, the black ones, the white ones, and the mixed samskaras are all a part of the world. But those impressions created by the experience of samadhi are unique. They are not black, not white. And these samskaras, when they are formed through repeated impressions of samadhi, then this, these samskaras oppose the development of other samskaras, which means those worldly samskaras, the black, white and the mixed samskaras are in opposition to the samskaras created from samadhi. So, the mind is now getting filled up with a new kind of knowledge. Knowledge that is coming out of Samadhi. This person who is experiencing the Samadhi is beginning to see the world in a different way. He has probably never seen the world like this before. And so the initial experience may be quite a shock because you wonder how it is that the world suddenly looks so different. Eventually, even the samskaras that oppose the development of other samskaras, even these are suppressed. So finally, the entire mind is in a state of nirodha. It means basically there is only Rithambara, only truth. It is filled with truth and that is objectless samadhi. There is no beach. There is, you are not really having an object anymore. And for that, we can go again back to our diagram. So we saw that I had said that anything which is external from here onwards, any object is considered to be external, whether it's a ritual object, a physical object of sorts, it's the body, focal point on the body, whether it's the breath, whether it's a mantra or it's some aspect of the internal functions of the mind itself, all these are external objects. In Nirbij Samadhi, there is no more object because the self is resting in the self. This is the definition of yoga. And the self rests in the self. And that is Nirbija Samadhi.
So a question is, uh, if one attains Samadhi, does one get self-realized? Yes and no. Samadhi is a very important prerequisite for self-realization. This is when you're self-realized. Near beach Samadhi. But as I explained, there are different levels of Samadhi. So if your Samadhi is on an external object, or even on a subtle object here, somewhere in this region of body, mind, it is not self-realized. Self-realized is when you are established in the self and there is no more object. So there are different levels of Samadhi and the highest level is self-realization. You can say actually that the lower samadhis are really the beginning of the journey. Only one who has experienced that glimpse of one of the lower samadhis will have an interest to continue this. Or someone who has contemplated deeply over the mysteries of life and death and the nature of the universe and says, why am I here? Who am I? Only such a person would be interested in going into this study. Can one attain super consciousness through mantras? Well, mantra is one of the things one can use in meditation. But when you say mantras, um, one must understand mantra vidya, that just using multiple mantras, chanting or use of mantras which have not been prescribed by a teacher, which are not used in a systematic manner, mantras that are used without preparation, these will not help you attain anything. Mantras are called bijas, no? they are also bij mantras. So now, imagine you keep chanting different mantras. It is like a farmer is scattering seeds in the wind. He has not prepared the field and he is just scattering the seeds. What is going to happen? The seeds will just fly away in the wind. Even if they do land on the ground, because the ground is not prepared, the seed may not be able to hold on to the ground properly. And so such a plant sapling which even grows a little bit will just die. So such mantras are useless. There has to be a preparation. Without preparation, use of mantra is not very useful. A lot of people are using their multiple mantras, don't have a system, don't have a teacher, and this can be actually a waste of time. For use of mantra, you should be a part of a lineage, you should have a teacher who is very experienced and can guide you through this process here which you're seeing, from the body to breath to mind to unconscious mind. Okay. So all right. We can go to the next verse, which I think is the very last verse of the chapter, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, no, that, that was the very last verse of the chapter. So all, all the uh, impressions in the mind are suppressed. Suppressed is really not such a good word. I put Nirodha in brackets. But what happens? What are impressions? Samskaras. Samskaras, when these samskaras have all become roasted seeds, they don't grow anymore then you have Nirbij Samadhi. 
there are no more bija in there. There are no more bija, as in there are no more samskaras which will also grow. There is also no object then to contemplate on because you are established in nirvij samadhi. Okay. This is coming back to the idea that Shibu talked about. He said uh, uh, samskaras also bijas. Yes, samskaras are bija in the sense that they sprout, they grow. Okay, so the chapter one was a summary of the entire process. Following the Indian tradition, all scriptures always had a, a summarization or an overview. So it was generally either the first chapter or the first verse which summarized the rest of the scripture or a process. So in the Yoga Sutras, chapter 1 is a overview of the whole process. Explains the mind, it explains all the different forms of samadhi, it explains what yoga is. You know, these basic things are all explained from in chapter 1. So chapter 2 actually now begins with sadhana, practice. So what do we do? Now that this process has been summarized, we are now ready for the practice. So verse 1 says, Tapas Swadhyay Ishwar Pranidhan Akriya Yoga. So tapas, the word tapas is often translated as austerities. This is sometimes misleading because it makes us think now we all have to suffer. But tapas comes from the word tapa, which means heat. So training, disciplining oneself and training, doing sadhana, practicing, training oneself, training the senses and the mind, this is tapas. So when you discipline yourself and train yourself, you are practicing tapas. Swadhyay is self-study. It may include some scriptural study, but that would come under the section of testimony. We also need to have inference and direct experience. So, Swadhyay also means studying the self, studying the senses, studying the mind, getting to know oneself. And then you have Ishwar Pranidhan, that is expansion or opening to the universal self. If you have read the Yoga Sutras or if you have encountered this term before, you will find that almost everywhere it is translated as surrender. Ishwar Pranidhan is surrender. Now if you examine the words, Ishwar is universal consciousness. We discussed that in one of the earlier sessions, that Ishwar is is a purush or is pure consciousness that has never taken a form. That means it is pure consciousness or universal consciousness. Pranidhan means expansion or opening. So what Ishwar Pranidhan means is gaining an access to pure consciousness. It's kind of an opening. Very often the word surrender gives us a wrong impression because people who think that they have to surrender, they don't know exactly what it means. They think, hmm, 
okay, that they have to surrender to a person. So they think they have to surrender to a teacher. That's not the case. They think they have to surrender to a deity, god or goddess. But in fact, surrender is to something higher, but in the form of expansion or opening. You have, then you're in touch with that infinite knowledge, which is the universal self. Surrender does not mean to, to be fatalistic, because very often Ishwar Pranidhan is interpreted as surrender, which is fatalistic. We just let things come and go and don't do anything. Don't get affected, don't react to things and go with the flow. These are the kind of words I hear very often. And this is misleading because this is sometimes very fatalistic. And yoga is not fatalistic. It is empowering. It helps you to take your life in your own hands. It helps you to become the architect of your life. So Ishwar Pranidhan is opening up to the universal self and getting access to this infinite knowledge, which is loving, which is unconditional, which is very helps you feel safe and it's, it will take care of you. There's a feeling of trust. And that is what Ishwar Pandha means. When you understand this, you will understand that this is not something fatalistic. This is the three parts of Kriya Yoga. Now again, when we use the words Kriya Yoga, lately, in the last decades, it has become associated with a certain tradition coming from Swami Yoganand, who first talked about Kriya Yoga. He was referring to the Kriya Yoga exactly here in the Yoga Sutras 2.1. What happened was that this Kriya Yoga here has now become a kind of a brand name for that particular lineage or tradition. But it is not restricted to that lineage or tradition. Kriya Yoga is for anyone who is putting in effort, that is, disciplining himself, doing self study, and opening up or expanding, is practicing a form of Kriya. So that is Kriya Yoga. Okay, any questions on verse 1? I think everybody seems to be clear. So we come to verse 2. So Kriya Yoga should be practiced to attenuate the glaciers and attain Samadhi. So for those who want to attain Samadhi, want to expand their consciousness, they should practice some form of discipline, self-study and expand consciousness. That is Kriya Yoga. So I don't think there is so much to discuss here because the word Klesha is of course maybe something that we need to talk about. We will talk about it in great detail. But we are referring here to verse 1.5 when we talked about klishta and aklishta, these are colored 
thoughts and uncolored thoughts. So the idea is always to reduce the coloring. I used the example of a dog and I said you look at a dog and you can be very colored about it and you will see a dog and if you have been bitten you will just see a monster and if you like dogs and you have had no bad experience then you will see a very cute cuddly animal so that is a klesha and we see all objects around us in this colored way even a simple thing like a pen could have a coloring maybe the pen is a very expensive pen it was a gift and so it has a coloring you get attached to, to the pen So, almost any object you set your eyes upon may have some coloring or the other. Some are not important to us, which means that there is not much coloring or there is no coloring. So, all these are also considered to be like seeds or glaciers. And the idea is to decrease the coloring. So there are basically five important forms of glaciers. Glaciers is nothing other than the wrong cognition. And first is avidya which is a lack of awareness. Second is asmita, which is your sense of identity. Then there is raga, which is attachment. Dvesha, which is aversion. And abhinavesha, which is clinging on to life. Abhinavesha is often translated as fear of death. But when one looks at the um, Sanskrit word it means clinging on hanging on to something so it's not a fear of death but it's more clinging on to life we have a sense of inertia most of the time whatever state of consciousness we are in we don't really want to get out of that it's a kind of inertia we, we, we get stuck at a certain level of consciousness. And that is also seen with regards to life and death. Even if you are totally miserable, still very rarely would somebody want to kill himself. It's not that common. People go through a lot of misery and suffering and still hang on to life. Even very old people who have, they are over 90, they will still be hanging on to life the moment the time of death comes. There will be fear. So that is Abhinivesh. And these are the five glaciers of the wrong cognition that we have, the wrong impressions. In our next session, Next Friday, we will be going into detail with each of these, especially of Avidya and all the other four. Any questions just before we end the session? It could be about these specific verses or in general about what we did today. Okay, in that case, we will see you all next Friday and have a nice weekend. Bye-bye.
my bye bye Debbie bye bye Chandra bye Shibu bye everyone.